All right. My hope is to make some of these videos are uh, basically recordings over the PowerPoints to highlight some of the main ideas and explain the reading from my perspective um, to share with you guys. So I'll try to do this for a number of the readings. I might uh, just skip over some slides. That's because I think when I present this in class, uh, I try to have a dialogue and some conversation. But if it's just me talking, I'd like to try to just hit really the main points or keep it concise. All right, so I'm going to introduce the, the reading by Plato and kind of go through the PowerPoint here. Um, I want you to understand his ideas about education, the noble lie, uh, and kind of the impact he had. So Plato, um, this is one important thing I think to point out is that it's this is the advent of writing um, when ideas were just being written down. So something that I think gets confusing sometimes is Socrates was the, the person speaking. It was his ideas. He was kind of the teacher of Aristotle and Plato. Plato actually wrote down and recorded the dialogues of Socrates. So when we're reading The Republic, you could either attribute that to Socrates as his words or ideas, um, but Plato's the author, and so he generally gets put on the book. Um, and I just tend to refer to him uh, as Plato. Plato's ideas were aligned with Socrates. They shared um, the similar ideas, and I think Plato really developed uh, the ideas of Socrates. Aristotle kind of went off in a different direction. Um, one thing to, to highlight and connect is that Plato is in the same position as Jefferson. Like He's in um, Athens and Greece at a time when society was changing, and so the overall republic is about, it's sort of a rumination on ideal society like how do we create the perfect society and of course a major component of that throughout the book is education and one thing I want to um, just mention quickly his allegory of the cave is um, he, he sort of ruminates or, or thinks through this idea of people being uh, born into and, and into a cave and chained up where they only see shadows on the wall um, throughout their life and then he says Imagine if you know one of these people were freed, They're, they wouldn't have their muscles developed. They would have to almost crawl to get out of the cave. They would they they would slowly sort of go up this this path, and they would emerge, and the sun would hurt their eyes. But eventually, they would see that everything they had come to know was kind of an illusion, and there was a deeper sort of truth. This is his allegory or idea, I think, about enlightenment and education, and. I think this helps you to kind of better understand the noble lie a little bit. Uh, he also kind of, as part of this, thinks about what were to happen if that person were to return and try to explain to the others that what they were seeing or had come to know was real was just a lie or, you know, kind of a, a mistake. And as far-fetched as it might seem, there are some periods in history um, when you do look at things like the advent of the telescope and realizing that the Earth wasn't the center of the universe, that we were rotating around the sun and that the Earth rotates and all these things. There were some times throughout history that there were fundamental trans transitions in the way that people thought about things, similar to his analogy here. And the other one that I would reference is if you look at uh, a lot of people who are considered monumental thinkers or, or um, people that, just like in this allegory where he you know, he believes that the, the prisoners, the people in there, would want to kill the person trying to say that this is all an illusion. Likewise, if you look at people like Dr. King or a lot of religious figures, they weren't treated well um, for sharing their ideas. That's something I tend to think is more fun than uh, students do. All right. Um, so two of the big things related to education for Plato are, for him, it's all about society. It's like the perfect society. For, for Rousseau, another philosopher, it was all about the individual. For Plato, it's all about society. And it's about developing virtues or ethics in people um, and creating a stable society, selecting leaders for society. The noble lie is part of this. He says, of course, lying is wrong, but we need to find those who are most devoted and committed to the community. So the people you select for to be leaders are those devoted to, most devoted to the community. And he gets pretty radical about this in the book. He almost 
thinks that people shouldn't have families or uh, children that they fully have as their own just because they shouldn't remove their, their focus from um, the community. So he has this idea of watching kids from an early age, looking for those who are most devoted, things like two that I think are weird in the, the reading um, that we do still look for today, people who um, don't change their beliefs based on what they want other people to hear, people who are, you know have some some fundamental underlying values. Um, so he, he that's what's going on. And, and another thing of reason that I think the reading is a bit confusing, um, and I should have maybe explained this a little bit better, that is that it's written in a dialogue between multiple people. And so that dialogue can get a little hard to uh, untangle a little bit. But I, again, I think if you if you go into what he's saying, he's really talking about, you know, leaders not having too much money, for example, so that they're not kind of lazy and too affluent also though that they're not that they don't have so little that they try to steal from others or take from others uh, and he thinks that again even though lying is wrong that there is one situation in which a lie is justifiable and he calls this the noble lie and basically he doesn't believe that people would do what you ask of them unless they have a belief that underlies that and in the case of getting people to accept their kind of their role in life, he says we need to tell them that they were born in the earth, God's made them. One part of it is pretty nice. It's that everybody's sort of a brother and everybody's interconnected. But that that people are made up of, of sort of different metals, some with gold, some with silver, some with iron. Um, and of course, iron and bronze is, is the most prevalent. Um, and so this is to get everybody to do their job. And iron and copper, those would be the workers. Um, those are the people that, that are required to have self-discipline. The auxiliaries are, are the soldiers or police officers. They're the people who guard and protect society. They're valued in terms of courage. And then the more rare uh, class would be gold, and those would be the guardians, the people who are the leaders um, who kind of look over the community. And their value is wisdom. And so again, this is to get each person to do their job. And again, he's kind of complicated in the sense that again, he doesn't seem to trust people to make their own decisions or to accept what they, you know, are, are intended to do in life. But he does believe that, you know, workers could have children that grow up to be leaders, and likewise, leaders can have children who will end up being workers. Uh, he didn't see this as a class-based system. That's what he was trying to get away from. He grew up in, a, in an, uh, an aristocracy where people inherited their position in life. This is the same, too, by the way, for Jefferson. Jefferson was born an aristocrat, but he wanted to leave that behind. He never talked about his roots or his family or his um, class when once he was part of the United States. Um, that's what Plato wanted to do, too. So I, I think that I've, I've hit a lot of the major points. Um, I do think ultimately, while there's a lot of good in Plato and a lot of really interesting ideas, I do think that that um, ultimately his idea is kind of flawed. I think the utilitarian argument that he makes is problematic. This is the idea that something is justified if it makes the greatest number of people happy or fulfilled. And I think there's a lot of counterexamples you can give to that um, principle. And one, one would even be, I think, in, in the domain of special education, we often um, make provisions or do things that might only impact or help a small number of people, but we still know ethically that it's the right thing to do. Maybe that's part of what's going on currently, even if you look at, um, you know, shutting things down and, um, you know, asking young people to make some sacrifices, it's, it's problematic in one way, but I think, again, you're trying to do that to protect um, certain people. All right, um, I feel like I've, I've covered a lot of these ideas. The shepherd analogy is basically, that again, that idea that if, um, if you want people to rule in the interest of the community, you have to make sure that they're not so affluent that they become detached, and then at the same time not so uh, hungry or, or you know needy that they prey on 
Um, so he he talks about in the in the book that you know dogs who are who are left hungry prey on their own flock. Those who become too full or have too much to eat become lazy um, and distracted. I'll just finish up by telling you there are a number of different movies that really tease out Plato's ideas. The Dark Knight is one. Um, the if you look at The Dark Knight Rises, the end of The Dark Knight was kind of based on a lie. He, ta- he if you haven't seen it yet, it's kind of a spoiler, but um, he he claims that he was responsible for Harvey Dent's death and uh, so that the people would have this person to look up to. And then The Dark Knight Rises teases out this idea of can a society be based on a lie, and I, I do think Christopher Nolan does a good job of analyzing that. Another uh, film that I think is really interesting, or book, if you happen to be into reading, is Divergent. And um, you can look up the trailer for Divergent, and I think even if you watch the trailer, you will see it's kind of an interesting um, examination of this idea that uh, that an ideal society would have people playing specific roles or, or you would have people aligned with what they were most suited to do. And I also think this is a really good examination of that idea. And also as to why that idea is inherently problematic. All right, well, I hope this better explains uh, the reading. If you want, just give me feedback. I'd be happy to slow down a little bit as I go through this. Um, And again, I'll I'll just try to keep making these and, and see if I can get the information across.